Good day, everyone. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is what I like to call scenarios of linear equations. This is kind of an odd topic. It's never really a topic on its own, but this is something I put together to demonstrate how we can transition between each uh, representation of linear equations. Uh, but instead of using representations, of course, I use scenarios. It's important to know uh, when we have linear equations, there's four different ways we can represent them. And really, we can represent them with an equation. First and foremost. And of course, that equation that we like to use is y equals mx plus b. In Algebra 1, this is the most common type of linear equation that we use. There's also standard form and point slope form. Those are not as much talked about as the slope-intercept form, though. So we have our equation. That's one form. Another form that we like to talk about are graphs. And of course, this is when we actually have a coordinate plane with our line drawn on them. So when I say graph, I want you to think that we have an x-axis, we have a y-axis, and then somewhere on there, we have a line that spans across it. So a graph is very much the visual representation of our linear equation. After graphs, of course, one of the things that we will talk about, and which is widely true, are word problems. Believe it or not, there are many uh, word problems, many real life situations which uh, represent a linear equation or can be represented by a linear equation. And so one such thing would be, suppose I have a limited amount of money to spend, but I need to get gas and I want to drink from the convenience store. The gas has a typical rate, uh, however it might be, maybe $2, maybe $1.95 per gallon. And then if I'm getting just one beverage, it's just a constant cost. So that's just one example of a scenario of linear equation that can be represented as a word problem. Last but not least, we also have what are uh, typically called in-out tables. Now really, we just typically refer to these as tables, and we throw the in-out to kind of give you an idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, to have you think about what goes into the equation and then what comes out. Typically, the x is what goes in. The x is our independent variable because it's what we plug into. And y is typically what we get out because y depends on what x is, if that makes sense. And so this diagram here, the point of it is to say that I can go from one to another quite easily. And that's really what we're looking at. We're going to try to look at, we're going to start with one of these forms, and then we're going to move to another in order to demonstrate just how versatile lin uh, linear equations are. So we're going to start out by looking at in-out tables, naturally. Uh, to make an in-out table, really there's three steps in my mind. I've, I've outlined the steps here. These are steps that I came up with. They're not necessarily official, but really this is kind of like the step-by-step -step process that you would do. To make a table, what you first do is you make a t-chart. And I'm going to demonstrate this over here. Typically, we make a t-chart. Now on the top left, we typically have x. In the right, we have y. These are also our in and our out. What we plug in for x influences what we get out for y. Now what we're going to do with this chart is we're going to take values of x and plug them in. And typically what we want to use are the top five choices, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So I'm going to plug those into my chart. And you may be wondering, why do we use those specific values? Now, we use these values because they are, I mean, there's only five of them. It limits our choice. It gives us enough to work with. But it helps us see what the equation is like when our values are negative, what our values are like when we have 0, and what our values are like when they're positive. So this is a way of seeing the range of values and what we get out for y. And so, of course, our third step, after we set this all up and we plug in uh, 
we're, what we're going to do, we're going to use uh, negative 2 through 2 for x values or in values. We're going to take these and we're going to plug these x's into our equation or graph to get our y values. So I have four examples below. Make a table for the following equations. And I know that there isn't uh, the greatest amount of space, but if you're copying down on a other piece of paper, that's fantastic because you will have a lot more space than I do. <laughs> so make a table for the following equations. Number one is 3x minus 5. y equals 3x minus 5. And that's in our typical y equals mx plus b. So to make a table, like I said, we're going to use our t-chart. And we're going to plug in x and y. And I'm going to use negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And of course, like I said, we plug those in. <clears throat> so when we plug these in for x, I'm going to have, for instance, 3 times negative 2 minus 5. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 minus 5, negative 11. So negative 2 for x equals negative 2, our y value is negative 11. And of course, it's important for us to notice that uh, our y is, of course, different from our x. That's the very point of the rate of change. So as we just continue, let's just continue to plug these values in and see where they go. 3 times negative 1, that's negative 3. Uh, subtracting 5, negative 3 minus 5 is negative 8. 3 times 0 minus 5 is just negative 5. And I, you can wait till the end to plug all these values in. You can plug them in as you go. It really doesn't matter. Just make sure that you have your calculations correct. I'm actually going to bring my work over here, and I'll do 3 times 1 minus 5, and then I'll do 3 times 2 minus 5. 3 times 1 minus 5 is negative 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 5 is 1. So eventually we're actually going to cross over and y starts to go positive. But this is our table. And really, the neat thing about this that I hope you're, you're already thinking about is that what these give me are coordinate points on my line. So if I wanted to, I could easily transition from a table to a graph simply by plotting these coordinate points. That's all these are. These are x's and y's of coordinate points. Well, to get this idea down further, let's do, let's do example two. I'm going to create my t-chart, try and give myself a little more space than I did in the last one. Uh, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Okay. So again, we're just going to try and plug these in. So negative 2 times negative 2 plus 6. Uh, negative 2 times negative 1. Negative 2 times 0. Negative 2 times 1. And negative 2 times 2. And we're adding 6 to all of these. So when I plug these in, and let's solve. If you're using a calculator, totally fine. Negative 2 times negative 2, though, I hope you know, is a positive 4. Ooh, okay, so positive 4 plus 6, that's going to be 10. Then we have negative 2 times negative 1. Uh, negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2, plus 6 is 8. Negative 2 times 0, that's the easiest thing of all time, that's just 0. 0 plus 6 is 6. Negative 2 times positive 1 is uh, negative 2 plus 6 is 4. And I think you can start to see a pattern from this. Each time we seem to be dropping by 2. So negative 2 times positive 2, negative 4, plus 6 is exactly what we thought it would be. You start to see the pattern too. Uh, really, a linear equation is very much a pattern. Uh, you're increasing or decreasing by the same amount every time. That's where we get the slope from. The rate is the same. So you'll notice that each time I increase by x, I should say, look at this, each time I increase my x by 1, I'm decreasing my y by 2. And that pattern continues as we go down. Not that that is the most important point of this note section,
it's just a neat thing to observe that this pattern occurs. And that's something that might be able to help you out in the future. But again, uh, I really want to mention that these are coordinate points. So we can easily go from a table to a graph just by using these and plotting the points. I'm going to scroll up and I think we'll take a look just at number three and we'll move on because at that point you could easily do number four on your own. So, oh, we got, I threw in the nice one here. Let's see, x plus one. Well, I'm still using negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And if I just throw these in, all it is is just one times x. So I'm going to have one times negative two, one times negative one, one times zero, uh, one times one, and one times positive two. And we're adding one each time. So let's see what happens. One times negative two is negative two plus one is just negative one. So I'll plug this over here. Uh, one times negative one is itself negative one. Negative one plus one is zero. All right, so I'm already starting to see, like we increase by one, let's see if this continues to be the pattern. One times zero is just zero. Zero plus one is one. Ooh. One plus, uh, excuse me, one times one is one. One plus one is two. So I have one, two. And then one times two is two. Two plus one is three. So it did, it followed the pattern. Each time we increased our x by one, our y increased by one. So that's table in a nutshell. <clears throat> and uh, at this point, I think I'm gonna change my color. I'm gonna go green. Ooh, it's never bad to go green. Now, equations from graphs. This is something that we've already been working on. You might actually, uh, now that I think about it, we would have worked on this previously uh, when we talked about slope intercept form. But let's go ahead and look at this again. <clears throat> uh, because some of the notes that I've done in the past would normally uh, have two bulleted points already. This is going to be key to us because our graphs are not going to have points. We have to find the points ourselves. As I said in previous notes, identify the y-intercept first and label B. Now in this case, the second step is going to be to find two points on the graph. Find two points on the graph and use to calculate slope. Then label that M. And then of course all we do is we plug B and M into y equals mx plus b. Now some of you probably already know this stuff and you probably already get it so if you feel like skipping it you're welcome to but just make sure that you see this first part. Identifying the y-intercept like I've said in the past and hopefully you know we start at the origin and we go up or we go down until we meet the line. Now in particular our line is of course and uh, let me get it our line is this thing right here. Now we want to figure out where that intersects the y-axis. And of course, what that means is we're going to be going up because the point where it intersects the y-axis is right there. So I have to start at the origin and go to that point, And all I'm really increasing is 1. So our b, or y-intercept, is plus 1. Now in its own right, that can serve as one of our first points. This is where step two comes in, because not every graph gives you two bulleted points that you can use right off the bat. Now, it just so happens, and I'm going to clear this all off, it just so happens that our y-intercept is actually a point we can use, because it's on one of those grid intersections. Now, I need to find another point that is also on a grid intersection. And if I look, um, as I follow this line, I don't see any. And I'm just kind of following along, following along. There's a point. So there's only one other point we can use on this graph. Wow. That's something that can happen, though. But the point that I'm trying to make is, we, when we're not given points, we can find points as long as they are on grid intersections. See how this 
kind of meets on that crosshair, kind of like this one up here. That's how we find points on a graph when we're not given them. So we know that our b is 1, our y-intercept. We need to find slope. And again, we just do that by counting grid spaces. First, I have to find my rise, which is how far up or how far down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I went down 5. And because that's down 5, it's negative 5. And then, of course, over is 1, 2, 3. We went right 3, so our run is 3. And this means that our y equals mx plus b is negative 5 thirds x plus 1. Uh, if you would prefer to watch the whole video on slope-intercept form, I do have that already. It's already linked in my Canvas page. It's also here on YouTube. Um, what I would like to do then, because clearly we've already done equations from graphs. We've already worked backwards to uh, get equations from graphs. I just want to do number six, and we'll move on after that, to re-illustrate how we find points when we're not given them. So again, finding our y-intercept, that's as easy as start at, the or start at the origin, work our way up or down. So one, two, three, four. We went up four. So that is our y-intercept. Again, finding points. It just so happens that our y-intercept occurs on a point. So there's one point. Now this is actually going to incur one of our important, uh, one important thing that we can do. I need to look at this. As I follow the line back, again, I'm trying to find a second point that I can use, right? And as I follow the line, I'm just following it down. I don't see another point until I get to here. Remember that what we're looking for, just a general reminder, we're looking for places where the line hits these kind of grid intersections. Now, if you're wondering how are we going to do slope, don't forget, we always do this from left to right. So we need to count up and then count right. So we're starting out at this first point down here. And so as I do this, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that curved line I drew so we can see better. Better visibility is awesome. We're going to count up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Wow. We went up 8. So our rise is going to be 8. And our slow, our, our run, excuse me, 1, 2, 3. Looks like we only went over to the right 3. So we plug this into our equation. m is 8 over 3. We've got our x plus 4 because that's our b. Again, I know we've done this uh, before. Uh, what I'm hoping you take from this is how to find points on a graph when we're not given them. So let's go ahead and move on. And I'm actually going to scroll down just to make sure I'm not missing anything. OK, good. All right, real world problems. Now, these are going to be our word problems. And I really wanted to throw this in because I've had a number of students in the past who had a dickens of a time reading through word problems and breaking them down. So here's the thing. Whenever we have a word problem, we want to read each problem carefully and make sure that you understand the, the key information that's given to you. That's why I have that as step two. Identify the key information. There's a lot of throw out. There's a lot of filler. We want to find the absolute key stuff that we have that's given to us and go from there. We're also going to calculate and identify the slope. Now, in this case, yes, slope is m, but we also want to acknowledge that the slope is a rate. Examples of rate being uh, my favorite, dollars per gallon. So if it's $1.95 per gallon, it's $1.95 per gallon of gas. Or if you're traveling at speeds, it's 60 miles per hour. A rate will always give you uh, something per something unit, so to speak. I know that's very vague, but as we get into these examples, I'm really going to try to show you out. And really, uh, I'm really going to, I'm going to try to 
uh, show you what to look for. That's the purpose of this, right? When we look at these problems, they are just, they are as simple as simple can be. I didn't want to go far out. I just wanted to pull off the important information. Uh, give you examples that we could relate to. So directions for this, uh, write an equation for these word problems, which we can do. Now, number nine says, Evan is going to the county fair this weekend. Okay, this is setting the stage. Let me just tell you right now, that's not really important. We're just setting the stage for it. The admission to the fair is $5 and the cost per ride is 50 cents. Two sentences and that's all they gave us. We're still trying to write an equation because the equation, though it uh, is not mentioned, what we're trying to figure out is his cost for the evening, his overall cost. And so what you're going to see, how much he spends depends on uh, how much the entrance fare is, the entry fee is, and how much the cost per ride is. And that's actually the key information. Notice that the admission to the fare is $5. Now that does not say anything about per, that doesn't say anything about for each unit. This is just a straight up cost. The other thing that's given to us is the cost per ride. Ooh, the cost per ride is 50 cents. I'm dragging that out because of the keyword per. The word per, cost per ride, tells it that this is a rate. What that means is then, this is my slope. So then if this is my slope, and like we said, the admission to the fare is five dollars. That's just a that that is a just one-time cost. It's not going to change. It's not dependent on a unit. It is a one-time cost. So that must be my B. The only thing that I want to uh, illustrate further uh, is that this slope here. How do we write fifty cents? I hope you remember that when we write fifty cents, it's going to be a decimal point five zero because this is half of a dollar. But then this stuff, we can take our information since B equals five, B equals five dollars, and the rate is 50 cents per ride. I can just take these and plug them in. So how much he spends, and I really want to illustrate this, how much he spends in one night is equal to the 50 cents per ride, 0.5, 0.50x plus the $5 entrance fee. And I don't really have to put the dollar signs on this. We're only worried about the numbers, not the units. The units come out as a result of that. So that's a model for how much money he's going to spend in one night. And if we wanted to, just to take this even further to show you what we can do, we just took a word problem and made an equation out of it, right? We can also make an equ we can also go from this to make a table, can't we? If I wanted to, I really could make a table to represent uh, the number of rides. Now, of course, if he doesn't even go, uh, we in this particular case, allow me to say the linear equation would be uh, based on negative two to positive two, but Really, if you go to a fair, you either ride rides or you don't ride rides. There's no way they're going to do negative rides. That's a silly thing. But my point, like I said, is that I can go from a word problem to an equation, and then I can make a table based on that. And then if I really wanted to, I could then go to a graph. And just from this word problem, I could do all four representations of linear equations. So we could easily do the same thing with number 10. Let's find the key information. Alex bought a new truck for $42,935. Ooh, big number. According to the dealer, the truck will depreciate approximately $4,200 per year. Now remember that we're trying to find the key information. What do you notice? Well, hopefully you notice that he bought a new truck for $42,935. And what it says, what that tells us, or what it doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us a cost per unit. It doesn't tell us it's this much for each. It just tells us that the new truck is a solid amount. That means then that that must be my y-intercept. 
Now, this one we wouldn't want to graph for obvious reasons. That is a huge number. My y-intercept, or my initial startup, would be 42,935, and I don't want to try to graph that. What we also notice is that they tell us the truck will depreciate approximately $4,200 per year. Now, here's the reason that I really want to be specific. There's a reason I'm underlining depreciate. If you know what the word depreciate means, especially with a car, and maybe this is a lesson for some of you, depreciate means that the value will decrease. It's important to know that this means the value of the truck will depreciate or decrease. It means that the value is going down. So when I say depreciate, that means that our slope is negative. Our slope is going to be a negative number. So y is going to equal negative 4,200x plus 42,935. Like I said, I know that's a big number. That is a big number. But hopefully you're, you're starting to recognize the words that give away what is the rate and what is not said that gives away the y-intercept. And let's try and do number 11 real quick. I know I say real quick a lot, but uh, let's get it done and move on. If you buy a car wash at the gas station for $6, the cost per gallon is $2.35. If you have $40, write and solve a linear equation to find the number of gallons you can afford. Now this one is working backwards because what I wanted to see is what happens when we have a total, how do, can we figure out how, much, uh, how many gallons we can afford. Now this is combining a couple of things. Now let's ignore the $40 for a second and let's look at the gas station car wash and the cost per gallon. So you've already noticed I just said cost per gallon is $2.35. Cost per gallon means that that is my M, that's my slope. It's 235. Now what they also tell us is if you buy a car wash at the gas station for six dollars, that six dollars is going to be important for uh, reasons that uh, we should say. That six dollars is meant to be our startup. So really, that's going to be our y-intercept because that is a constant cost it's not going to change unless we bought more than one but odds are I don't know anyone who's ever bought two car washes in a row that'd be interesting if I did is that like the guy with the 83 watermelons in his car I don't know so really we're trying to plug this into a an equation and really if I'm purchasing a car wash and I'm purchasing gallons that's all adding up isn't it so what y is going to represent is cost. Cost in dollars, that is. So we have y equals mx plus b. Our m is 235. We've got the x, and we've got the b, which equals 6. Now really, to answer your question, I'll challenge you. Do this. Try this on your own when I tell you. The second part says if you have $40. $40 represents the total that you have. You can't go over it. So what you're actually going to do with that is you're actually going to plug that in for Y. This is something uh, very interesting to uh, divulge to you. This is something very uh, different. It's something we haven't talked about before. But if we have $40, $40 is the total amount we can spend. It might Y might represent cost, but it also... Um, represents the total. Cost and total are the same thing. And if I only have a total of $40 to spend, then that's all the more that I can have costed, so to speak. And so to go from here, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a two-step equation. Something I know you know very well how to do because X is going to give me my gallons of gas. So I encourage you, try to solve that on your own, just a little bit review, but hopefully you've got this idea that we can go from one form of a linear equation to another just like that. So hopefully uh, you found this enlightening. Hopefully you've uh, figured some stuff out. Until next time, have a great day.